Great. Thank you, Don. Um, I would, uh, I would add uh, happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. Um, from my cultural background, I've always felt there were two types of people in the world, those that are Italian and those that want to be Italian. But today I'll cede to you, Alan, and today is the day you were either Irish or would like to be Irish. So happy St. Patty's Day. Let's see if we... Uh, oh, okay. So, better like that? Okay. Thanks, Dick. There, we got it working. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and share today with you what kind of this, I call it the State of the Union address, uh, maybe not as controversial as Biden's, but um, wanted to share where things are at in Sarnia-Lampton, uh, particularly around uh, housing uh, and food issues, hunger and, and uh, homelessness. Uh, there we go. Uh, we'll start off with a little bit about the, uh, the evolution of homelessness because it has became, uh, become uh, quite more prominent in our community. I think a lot um, never really saw much around homelessness until the last few years. Uh, when, we, when I first started at the inn, we ran a, a shelter program using motels. We didn't have the Good Shepherd's Lodge. Uh, we did have the Haven, which is our youth shelter, uh, for nine, nine beds for youth there. Uh, but when we had people that were homeless, they were typically folks that were down on their luck, maybe had lost their jobs, being evicted, um, and we would put them in a motel for a couple or three weeks um, to be able to get them housed again. And, and that was a, a good process in terms of uh, having those temporary supports with them, and we were able to get people housed pretty quickly. Uh, that, uh, um, then, as the numbers kind of grew a bit, um, we felt there needed, working with the county, more supports for people. Out in the Golden Mile, they were kind of isolated um, and not regular contacts or supports for the short time they were there. So we built the, uh, the Good Shepherd's Lodge. We opened it about 12, 13 years ago. And that provided us with uh, 30, uh, 30 or 25 beds plus two what we would call family rooms or special needs rooms. But we could accommodate up to people, uh, 30 people there. Uh, when we first opened it, I think the first year we were aver averaging about 10 people a night, but we, we built it larger thinking we would have the space to accommodate any, any growth. Uh, when we, uh, uh, what we saw was a lot of our homeless in Sarnia are what we would call um, the hidden homeless, uh, couch surfers. People would, that, that would stay with family and friends, maybe a few nights here, um, over there for a few nights, and they just kind of circle around. So we didn't really see a lot needing shelter because most were kind of uh, very precariously housed. They were housed, um, they had a roof over their head, but it wasn't theirs and it was very transient. Uh, as, they, uh, as that started to change and we started to see more people come into shelter, then we, uh, we were hit by this thing called COVID, and that had a drastic change on homelessness. Prior to uh, COVID, we were averaging about between the lodge and the haven, we were averaging about 35 people a night in shelter. Um, at the peak of, of, of uh, COVID, we were uh, sheltering as many as 270 people who had become homeless through, through COVID. And people are probably thinking, why, why would COVID cause people to be homeless? But it was that hidden homeless, it was the couch surfers that were most dramatically impacted by COVID. Because people started to look at it and say, you know, I don't know what this thing is. They're telling us to be in a bubble. They're telling us to, you know, not to associate, to stop the spread. And I got somebody living on my couch or in my basement and I can't really have that because I don't know what's going to happen with, with COVID. Maybe somebody in my household is immune compromised or such. So all of a sudden, those people that were couch surfing, um, all of a sudden were being told, we can't have you here. And they were uh, being put out onto the street. And that created a huge wave of folks coming to us uh, looking, for, uh, looking for shelter. A couple months later, we saw a second wave come to us, a smaller one, but still significant. In, in terms of people that were maybe sharing, uh, sharing accommodation, uh, one person's name was on the lease, but maybe it was, uh, you know, they were friends or they were a, a, a couple, uh, but they were sharing this accommodation. And then as the isolation grew, as you were still confined to your, to your accommodation and really not going out into the community, uh, we'd get what I'd call cabin fever. Uh, people started to get on each other's nerves because you were spending 24-7 in the same, same apartment with this individual and relationships broke down. And when that started to happen, the person with the lease said, 
yeah, you're going to have to leave. I don't like you anymore. And so that's created another small wave coming to us. So as I said, at the end, uh, or at the peak of COVID, we had 270 people that we were housing, um, feeding, uh, clothing, and caring for uh, during that time. So that was a, a significant, significant impact for, for us as an agency uh, when uh, on that fateful day of March 13th when everything was shutting down, um, businesses, schools, everything was, was, was closing up. Um, we were actually gearing up because we, you know, in conversations with the Chief Medical Officer of Health, you're saying, Miles, you guys are going to need to be open because this is going to be some un un unprecedented need in our community. And so we geared up. Uh, there was only one program we closed over the, the whole uh, uh, years of COVID. Uh, everything else we kept running and, and expanded. So since COVID has kind of wrapped up, um, we were able to get a lot of people housed, a lot of people back into housing, um, into accommodation uh, to bring those numbers of 270 down. Uh, we, we have, um, uh, but one of the things we found is that, that we're still, um, still people, more people homeless, living rough than what we had experienced prior to COVID. And that was because some of those people that were, were allowing folks in couch surfing, after a couple of years of not having somebody on their couch or in their basement, they just felt that they preferred that and they weren't accepting people back into their homes. So um, the, the, the return to uh, couch surfing wasn't as great as, what, uh, as the numbers that were there before. Uh, so we uh, currently have 40 people in shelter uh, between the lodge and the haven. Uh, so we're at capacity at both those locations. Uh, we have 28 people in an overflow shelter. We've opened, during the winter months, we've started to open uh, an overflow shelter uh, to get those people that, uh, that are unhoused, that were living on the street, um, living in the rough, to get them uh, out of the cold weather. So currently this year uh, and last year, we utilized the Laura Lee St. Matthew's Presbyterian Church as our overflow shelter. So we have 28 beds there, uh, as well as an afternoon uh, program, uh, a day drop-in center that the county operates out of that, uh, that facility. We have uh, 95 people in alternate housing. So we've tried to be creative to try to get uh, people off the streets to get them housed. We've created a rent supplement program so that folks that were in shelter uh, during COVID, we had, had them in motels or at the shelter, and we wanted to get them housed because shelter is just not, a, for so many reasons, isn't a great place for somebody to be. Uh, so we started a rent supplement program where we could uh, top up between what their income is and what the rent would be to get them into an apartment. We could top that up on a, on a temporary basis as they stabilized and looked at other income sources. Uh, so that, uh, we, between that and a program we called um, Halfway to Home, uh, we were able to get 90 people um, sheltered. So the Halfway to Home is kind of like... Uh, um, I remember uh, my first job, I working in Toronto, I rented a bachelor apartment in Toronto. Uh, one big room that had, you know, bedroom, dining room, everything in one room and a little side uh, area for a bathroom. So we, we were looking at how can we get people into accommodation. Not everybody wants a, a fancy three bedroom apartment. Um, and we were able to work out with the motel owners um, an, an opportunity for individuals to lease directly from the motels at a longer rate, not uh, you know, on a daily rate of $90 a, a day, um, but for a month rate, um, make it more reasonable, closer to an apartment uh, uh, amount of rent. Uh, and sometimes we'd put in a, a supplement program to help that as well, but that got another group of people housed and, and off, the, uh, off the streets that way. So it still leaves in the, uh, in the better weather uh, about 30 to 40 people living, living rough on the streets. Um, some of those folks are there uh, by choice. Um, and we see the numbers come down, uh, living rough in the winter. As, as, as the weather gets colder, they want to come in. But when the weather's nice, they prefer to be outside. Uh, some of that is, is because of mental health and addictions issues. Um, somebody with mental illness, um, a dormitory style setting is is difficult environment to live in. Um, when you have psychosis or paranoia, paranoia um, when uh, psychotic episodes, um, having a number of people around you in a dormitory is is a real struggle. Uh, so when the weather's nice, they prefer to be out, outside. Um, we do have some people on restrictions. 
uh, people that can't come into either of the shelters, uh, and that's uh, often uh, a result of uh, addictions, um, violence, aggression. We're seeing a different demographic, a different characteristic of people now in terms of homelessness. So some of them uh, are on a, on a service restriction. That's uh, very much, and it, those service restrictions are usually a couple weeks, so a month, depending on what the situation is. In the winter time, we drop those down to a night or two so that there's still some kind of ramifications for actions, but recognizing we can't have people, uh, people outside. So the two major challenges we're facing around homelessness right now is, um, is the uh, behavioral issues. As I mentioned, we're seeing uh, um, the addictions and the uh, uh, opioid uh, crisis in our community is significant now, and so we're seeing uh, a lot of a lot more people with addictions issues um, in coming into shelter than we did prior to uh, prior to COVID, um, and that addictions is creating issues around behavior, aggression, uh, assaults uh, of clients, assaults of staff. Um, so that, as I said, may lead to um, an individual being on a restriction because of their behavior. But it's much more difficult to manage. The number of uh, overdoses we're having uh, is, is significant. Before uh, COVID, if in the shelter we administered Narcan once a month, that, that was uh, an, an occasion for us. That was something. Um, now, on average, we're administering Narcan uh, two, three, four times a week, um, and typically, or we've we've had as many as six doses to revive somebody. So that so that's a, that's a, a horrible plight on our on our community, on all communities, is the issue of uh, addictions. The other significant challenge we're facing right now um, is the affordability of housing. Um, you know, prior to COVID, um, homelessness was often thought as being a big city issue. It was Toronto, it was London, it was Ottawa that had those kinds of issues. Uh, but it's it's an every town issue right now. Making it worse for us is the the, the change we've seen in the housing prices. Hamilton, uh, London, Toronto always had higher, much higher uh, rental uh, rates. You know, seven years ago we had a, we had a unit over on, um, uh, on um, Colburn, just under the bridge, uh, apartments there. Uh, we had a, a fellow in there at $695 uh, a, a month for rent. A one bedroom, 695 It was a good place. It was decent, it was clean, it was well looked after, it was a decent neighborhood. So it was a really, really good spot to have people. That very same unit now is going for $1,295. So it's gone up $600 in about seven years, seven years time. It's not costing the landlord $600 a night more or a month more to run that apartment, but that's what the market rate is going. So lots of pressures pushing the prices of, uh, of rent up. And so we're seeing most people, it's, it's not affordable, particularly if you're on Ontario Works or Ontario Disability, so you're on a, a, a government benefit income, uh, and a single person on OW will receive just over $700 a month. A uh, single person on Ontario Disability, um, so a gov the government and a doctor has said they can't, they can't work, um, the government gives them about $1,100 for a disability pension. So when your rents are going up so dramatically, um, your income just doesn't cover it. For people working uh, part-time jobs, uh, minimum wage, uh, limited hours, uh, it becomes very difficult um, as rents go up for people to manage to, to live in that. So that's, uh, that's a huge challenge in our community and a lot of the push be behind a number of groups like the, the Rotary Club uh, pushing uh, for the government um, to build affordable housing and, and promoting that. So how are we responding in terms of housing at the inn? Uh, we, uh, we have our food programs. Uh, so soup kitchen, a uh, number of food uh, meal programs. We've got the food bank. Uh, we do um, snack bags that are tailored to homeless people. So um, somebody coming in who doesn't have an address, who's unhoused, staying in shelter or, or on the street, um, giving them, uh, letting them go through the food bank and getting a box of food um, gives them a lot of stuff that they can't use. They don't have a can opener, they don't have a means of cooking it, and so a lot of the food is wasted. So we've put together uh, uh, street bags that are more specific to things people could use with a pop top, um, things like puddings, granola bars, bread items, things that they could use that way. Um, so we have those, uh, 
those uh, bags that we hand out at the food bank uh, for folks who are unhoused coming in. The two outreach uh, workers from the county pick those up regularly and as they visit the spots where uh, people are known to be uh, uh, living in the rough, they take those, uh, those snack bags to them as well. <clears throat> We, uh, our uh, shelter programs immediately, or uh, the immediate shelter is the lodge, um, our adult uh, shelter, uh, and we have, we've expanded beds there, so we have uh, 32 beds there now. We have the Haven, our youth shelter, and of course the Laura Lee overflow that I'd mentioned earlier. The innovative housing, uh, those are the programs are trying to um, be creative to get people um, housed. Um, that would be the family, uh, family shelters. We have um, a number of families in shelter immediately with us right now. Um, and there's no space at the lodge because it's, it's all uh, full with uh, adults. Uh, so we have motels that we, uh, that we put the families in until we can help get them housed. Uh, we have uh, rent supplement and the halfway to home program. And uh, from a, um, a permanent, uh, a long-term solution, um, that really is key to uh, affordable housing, to have permanent housing. So we're working on a couple of projects with, uh, we're partnering with Habitat for Humanity. And next, um, next spring, uh, we uh, anticipate breaking ground in, uh, in April next year uh, to build a, a five unit tiny townhouse project. So first kind of opportunity for tiny, uh, tiny homes in Sarnia. So we're really excited about that. And the other uh, we're working on is an affordable housing build. Our Laura Lee property, uh, where, where we're the church where we're doing the overflow shelter, we have the option for purchase of that. Um, and we're looking at a, um, expanding a bit of a larger land package. And we're working on designs for a, a 50 unit affordable housing build. Um, one and two bedroom apartments. The one bedrooms would be going for eight, nine hundred dollars uh, a month sort of thing. So we're really excited about that opportunity. We're in the process of you know, uh, rezoning applications to city and we hope that will go to them uh, in the late spring. Um, hopefully approved in the fall so we can move forward on that. But that's a, a, that's a big project. Uh, we're anticipating it'll be probably about $15 million to build uh, the, uh, build the uh, a unit, but that'll give us uh, 50, uh, 50 good units for folks. So that's kind of where we are in terms of shelter. Um, for uh, food and hunger, um, the impact of costs has been, uh, well, we, we've all felt uh, the cost in, of inflation. Uh, every time you go to the grocery store, how much more your, your grocery bill is or how much less you put in the cart uh, because your, your, your dollars available are the same. So our, our current food programs we're doing, we've got the uh, uh, food bank, which is a grocery store model. Uh, people have the dignity of choice of coming in and selecting the food they want rather than a stranger filling a box and giving it to them. Um, and that treats people with more dignity um, and also is uh, a much better, makes us much better stewards of the community's generosity. Um, folks are getting food they want and need rather than getting back home with this pre-packed box and, and finding things that their kids won't eat or they're, they're allergic to or here's some items that I already have four of in my, in my cupboard. So um, a lot less wastage by doing the, uh, the grocery store model. We have the soup kitchen, which is our daily meal program, uh, hot lunch during the week and on weekends, it's a, it's a supper meal. Uh, we have our mobile market program, which is really focusing on health. Um, in the summer months from uh, 1st of July through to about mid-November, we go to, uh, well, we're just adding an, a new location out in Sombra. So we'll be going to 16 locations every week this summer um, with a setup like a farmer's market. Folks can come in and uh, we've got the table behind the truck stretched out with fresh vegetables and fruit and they can come every week and get that healthy produce. Uh, we have, uh, uh, there'll be six locations here in Sarnia and 10 out in the county, um, Amgenong, Kettle Point, Watford, Elvinston, Bedford. So it really reaches out throughout the, uh, the county. Um, we're seeing about 1,200 people a week access the, the uh, mobile market. Uh, we'll we'll, uh, we'll uh, distribute about 6,000 pounds of vegetables every week. And it's all about people getting fresh, healthy stuff, uh, which really makes a difference in terms of their lifestyle and their being able to eat healthy, uh, because eating healthy, we all know, is, is uh, not, not cheap at all. Our snack pack program is the summer program as well, recognizing that... Um, 
the end of June, when the bell rings at school um, and the kids are off for the summer, there is no student nutrition program. And many families are reliant on that student nutrition program to provide uh, some, some uh, healthy food to the kids each day. So with the snack pack program, every week on the mobile market truck, families can go and pick up a snack pack for each of their kids. Uh, that will have uh, at least 21 items in it. So there's three snacks a day. Um, it includes five fresh fruit as well as yogurt tubes and cheese strings. So that again, it's about nutrition for the kids. It's about having energy for them, good healthy energy so that they can be out doing healthy play rather than sitting at home watching the TV or playing a game. Um, we, we partner with Red Cross because there are a, a number of folks in our community that don't have the ability uh, for mobility issues or health issues to get to the food bank. So we distribute about uh, 8 to 12 uh, Red Cross boxes every day to folks that are shut in in their, in their communities. And that's a great partnership with the uh, Red Cross. They'll pick it up and deliver it to, uh, to individuals. And then I mentioned about our homeless bags um, for folks that are living in the rough. So with the food environment we're facing right now um, is there's uh, supply chain uncertainty, some held over from, from COVID. It's one of those lasting effects. Um, it's getting better, but there are some times we just can't get certain products. Um, and um, sometimes the grocery store managers don't even, even know why they're not coming through. Um, the cost of inflation has had a, has a, had a huge impact. Um, we all know going grocery shopping, how much more uh, the food is costing. So when you're on a very uh, limited income, um, that makes it a real challenge to be able to do that, uh, that shopping. Uh, the other thing that we're working on and on a positive sense is more of a food recovery program. Um, we've always relied on donations, um, food drives, things like that coming in. Um, we've really, over the number, uh, probably about the last 10 years, really built up a food recovery program so that we're getting uh, from grocery stores, from restaurants, from bakeries, we're getting uh, some of their food recovery, stuff that would normally have been thrown out, we're now able to, uh, to recover. So with the impact of inflation, it's kind of a double-edged sword for us. We have folks that, um, uh, more folks using the food bank now uh, because of that need. Their food dollars just don't stretch. They're on limited income, uh, they're working part time, their hours aren't always great, so they just don't have enough money now uh, to, to raise or to be able to provide for themselves. And what we're seeing are families that people we've not seen before coming in and use the food bank because they might have been able to just kind of make ends meet, stretch, you know, week to week, paycheck to paycheck, um, and didn't really need to use the food bank a lot, maybe once in a while. Um, often more they'd use some of our, our seasonal programs like the birthday club or winter coats or that, but they weren't regulars in the food bank. Uh, we're seeing more now because they just don't have those dollars to, to stretch to, for the higher cost of food. Um, what we're also seeing is um, donations are dropping in terms of the food donations coming in. And that's where this makes the food recovery program so much more important for us. So people going to the grocery store that would normally pick up a few extra items and leave it in the barrel on their way out or pick up some things for different food drives we're doing, um, their, their food budget is stretched as well and they just don't have those extra dollars to pick up those few extra things. So we're seeing our donations drop, uh, but the number of people um, accessing the food bank has, has gotten higher. So a little bit about the numbers. Uh, we're now seeing about 2,200 people a month access the food bank. Uh, prior, uh, pre-COVID and just after COVID numbers, it was about 1,850 was kind of our normal. So it's about a 20% increase in the number of people accessing for food services. Um, and uh, yet we're seeing that likewise about a 20% drop in, in food donations coming in. Thanksgiving food drive uh, was half of what we would normally get uh, in the fall. Our cops for cans, uh, the uh, November food drive that the police do for us, again, it was about half of what we would normally get. So we're seeing um, uh, food donations are, are dropping coming in. We're using about 55,000 pounds of food every month. Uh, and uh, if you wander around the mall, uh, you've got a couple days left before construction comes down, but there's some great structures in the mall, uh, 55 or 50 uh, 
252,000, sorry, uh, different food items. We'll, we'll know the weight after Tuesday night when I bring it back in. But if you wander around that, um, you'll see huge amounts of food. Um, picture that, though, it'll last about three weeks for us. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of volume of food that we're, uh, that we're going through. And because donations are down and need is up, uh, our purchases have increased significantly. We went from pre-COVID spending about 5000 a month on, on food purchases, where we're averaging about 20000 a month now um, in, in food pur purchases. So I'm um, trying just to make up that difference to make sure that there's food on the shelves for, for folks. So that's a, a bit of a, a recap of where we are. Um, I'm going to go back to food recovery because it's not all doom and gloom. We're getting really good response from a food, our food recovery programs. So almost every grocery store now we're in and picking up um, once, a, um, once a week or several times a week, you know, their, their, their breads, their bakery items, their uh, vegetable items. Um, things have changed in the grocery environment and they're now more willing to um, provide food to us. So for example, um, the meat uh, in the bunker um, has a package done and used before date on it. So if it comes close to that use by date, then they then throw it in the freezer uh, and we'll pick it up because once it's frozen, it extends the life for three months. So working with the grocery stores to do that kind of thing has really brought a larger volume of food recovery in. And the things that are often more difficult for us to get, people who donate at a food drive or at the grocery bear will put canned items in they're not buying meat and putting it in there. So those proteins, those vegetables, um, those, uh, the dairy items, they're really important, um, again, for that healthier diet. So we've, we've had really good success with the food recovery program, and that's helping to fill some of that, uh, some of that gap. So uh, thank you for, uh, for your support uh, as a fellowship. Um, you, uh, you contribute regularly to us. A number of you are, are uh, individual donors as well um, or volunteers. And uh, that's the way that really makes you know, Sarnia shine is when you know, we talked earlier about compassion and caring. Um, that's, that's how we're able to contribute and, and, and to impact so many lives is by the community contributing and supporting and caring and that compassion of 400 volunteers that we have at the end and the, and the food that, and the financial support that we get. So thank you for being part of a, a caring and a compassionate community. Thank you.